That's why the perception is that Tesla may not be an AI company, but they definitely are. Tesla's insane amount of real world data is going to allow them to do things that other companies cannot. The amount of data that they have, the amount of GPUs that they have, and how he's thinking about it, I would probably bet on Optimus being... There's no bigger topic than AI and robotics AI these days. So let's dive deeper and learn more. Do you need the humanoid form factor like the Tesla bot or other forms of embodied AI to get to AGI? Humanoid bot companies are partnering with AI companies like Figure just did with OpenAI. How might this work? And how might Tesla integrate XAI into Optimus? And when might Tesla finally be seen as an AI company? So I invited Matthew Berman, a serial entrepreneur and engineer, to join us today as he's really set himself up as someone who's been following the AI developments closely. His YouTube channel has over 200,000 subscribers and he regularly gets over 100,000 views. Thank you so much, Matthew. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me, Herbert. I'm excited to chat about AI and Tesla and, and yeah, all things robots. <laughs> so your channel is uh, a, an amazing channel. You've just taken off in the last year. Uh, you have focused a lot on just anything that's happening in AI, the, the biggest developments. And then of course, as you must do, you are also covering humanoid bots, all the bot companies. And that's why it's great to finally hear from somebody who's not 100% in the Tesla community, but is really looking at it from overall. Although you did tell me that you're an investor in Tesla as well. So why don't we start with that? Um, when will people start to see Tesla as an AI company? And yeah, why is it taking um, for so long? So I, I want to mention, I have been an investor in Tesla over the years for, for many years. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm also just a big fan. I, I own a Tesla Model Y. I, just a, a big fan of everything they're doing. Um, so why isn't Tesla seen as an AI company? Or at least maybe not yet. Um, I think... ChatGPT skewed everybody's perception of what an AI company is, and rightfully so. I mean, that was world-changing technology. But so when, when people think about AI, now they think about large language models. You type something in mm -hmm. to a input box and, and you get a response. And that's typically what people think about when they think about AI. They don't think about autonomous driving as AI as much. I mean, I'm sure some people do, but I think the general perception is AI is large language models. Um, so autonomous driving, robots, this real world AI is incredibly important, but just the public's perception isn't quite there where they're thinking about it as the, this is AI and it is this kind of uh, tangential or, or similar in a lot of ways to large language models, but it is different because it is this real world AI where the Teslas have cameras on it, they're recording, um, and all of that data is being used to train autonomous driving models and also their uh, humanoid robot uh, optimist. So I, I think that's why the perception is, is that Tesla may not be an AI company, uh, but they definitely are. Okay, and then, so tell me about your perception of Tesla as an AI company. What is your thinking about, are they leading? Are they behind? I saw this recent table about who's buying the most uh, NVIDIA H100s, and you got Meta, 300,000. Then you've yeah. got, you know, the rest at less than 10%. Tesla's number six, but then Elon came out and he said, this is wrong. In this chart, we would be number two, Tesla would be number two, and XAI is number three. Do you have a guess of, you know, what is Tesla's uh, path in terms of their compute power? Yeah, I, I want to touch on their data set, because I think that's actually the most important factor to think about, um, and, and especially as it relates to GPUs. Meta has a ton of data. Google has a ton of data. This is all text-based data, right? We're talking about articles, mm -hmm. uh, newsletters, m movies, music, wh whatever it is, it's it's either text or it's like some kind of media. But Tesla has far and away the most real world data. All of, I think there was just a stat that they published where they just crossed a billion miles of mm -hmm. recorded driving data. That real world data will enable them to build AI that is 
incredible and and very different from large language models. It's just a completely different data set and will enable a lot of different use cases. Autonomous driving is the obvious one. That's why they're far and ahead on the autonomous driving path. But also, it helps for humanoid robots. Um, so it's it, it kind of bringing it back to GPUs. It's no surprise that they're buying so many because video data and and kind of real world video data is incredibly rich and data intensive, especially as compared to text data. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not surprised to hear that XAI. Um, it'll be interesting how they integrate what XAI is doing with large language models, which is much more akin to OpenAI, um, mm -hmm. and then what kind of Tesla's doing with their autonomous driving and their uh, um, uh, humanoid robots. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they just have a ton of data that no other, uh, for sure, car company has, right? Uh, Mercedes, BMW, Ford, they, they just do not have that type of data. Uh, and then it's also incredibly valuable for their humanoid robot because humanoid robots need to be able to behave and interact in the real world. And how do they do that with training on real world data, which really I think Tesla might have the most, if not definitely have has the most real world data. So tell me, how do you think that XAI um, is going to integrate with either the bot or the cars? And, you know, it, do you think that XAI is now caught up to OpenAI? Because there's hints by Elon saying that when they launch the next uh, version of Grok, it's going to be better than uh, ChatGPT five or four or whatever it is now. Um, so I'll I'll answer that second question first. I, I would be surprised if Grok outperformed GPT four. Mm -hmm. um, I know GPT four just launched a new version. I actually haven't had a chance to test it out, but they did say it was greatly updated. Um, I, I would be surprised, but they are making incredible progress, especially for the amount of time they've been working on it. I think within yeah. three months they released their first version from when they started to actually having a public release. It was just a few months, which is really incredible to think about because, you know, I think OpenAI took a year and yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars. So, and, and that's really a function of the technology um, and the commoditization of models in general. Um, I think there's two ways that they can integrate x.ai. Yeah. The first and one that I'm really excited about is just having an agent in your car to do things. Very simple, right? Uh, you're driving and first of all, it, can, it would be nice to just control the car and Tesla's voice activation features are fine, but I think they could be a, a lot better, certainly powered by XAI. And that's really cool. And then beyond that, within the car, you're in this environment in which you can't use your hands. Your voice is the primary interface. So being able to do things like... Um, uh, you know, hey, send a text message to my wife. I'm going to be home in five minutes. Or, hey, I want to order DoorDash. Get me sushi. I'll be home in 30 minutes. Um, things that you can do like that uh, will be really cool. Just having that agent in your car, uh, branded Tesla, branded whatever they want. Um, I think that is one obvious use case for X.AI. And then the other one is is building it into Optimus, being able to ha actually have a conversation with the robot and it understand your natural language and, you know, figure, you mentioned figure AI. Yeah. Um, they have a partnership with ChatGPT to do very similar things. Um, you know, the robot not only needs to understand the world and be able to interact with the world, but it needs to be able to understand humans and interact with humans in natural language. And that's the way it's going to be done through ChatGPT. So similarly, X.AI could be built into Optimus in the same way. And I think Elon is, thinking about Optimus as a factory robot at first. Uh, but I think the longer term vision is, you know, a robot in each household, very futuristic to think about. I, I'm, I'm all for it. I, I love that concept, but um, I think that that's like the obvious play, putting in x.ai to be able to actually have conversations with your own personal robot. Yeah. So you and I have both done videos showing how Figure did their demo with OpenAI. Very impressive, right? Because the bot didn't just, and it can actually understand the environment. It could tell you what's there. It's a plate. That's a glass. Uh, what should I do with it? Oh, you probably want me to take the plate, put it away into the rack, you know, give me the apple and it knows what is the apple. And then it can even self-reflect and it can say, how did you think you did? 
<laughs> it's, yeah. it seems unlimited, the intelligence of, so all the research you've done in this space, where do you see, you know, how far oh, the large language model will um, kind of progress, but also how they might be integrated into these bots in the future? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll preface with, uh, I, I'm, I'm certainly not a computer scientist and, um, yeah. I did make a video about the interview that Jan LeCun had with Lex Friedman. And Jan yes. LeCun is the head of Meta's AI, Lex Friedman, kind of famous interviewer on, uh, on mm -hmm. YouTube and other platforms now. And um, Jan LeCun tends to be a pessimist when mm -hmm. it comes to the potential of large language models. He doesn't believe that uh, language by itself is enough to construct a world model, meaning you, you know, kind of simulation theory. You can't simulate the real world with language alone. You need something else. Now, there's a lot of people who disagree with that and believe that language models with enough scale can essentially model the real world. And you look at Sora, which is uh, OpenAI's mm -hmm. video generation product, and that that's a good example. Um, Sora does an incredible job of uh, simulating real world environments, simulating physics, certainly far from perfect and it's always that last like 10 to 20 percent that's the hardest and 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 kind of bringing it back to tesla it's the same thing right the tesla autonomous driving is incredible but it's that last 10 to 20 percent that's going to be really hard to achieve um so i i, I i'm i'm pretty bullish on large language models taking us really far mm -hmm. i i don't i wouldn't i wouldn't say like i i am knowledgeable enough to predict that large language models alone will be able to simulate the world. Um, Jan LeCun, I'll defer to him. On the one side, he doesn't think so, but there are plenty of people, especially a lot of people at OpenAI, the Sora founder being one of them, who do think that language alone and the Transformers architecture alone is enough to simulate the world. Yeah, I was speaking to a Google DeepMind uh top expert. And of course he was saying, well, you know, you know, videos only simulation and videos only that you get. It is, I don't know, I can't remember the number, but you know, it's like millions or even bigger, just unbelievable number of, you know, learning and capturing human emotion, all range of human emotion. And so he was just implying that the large language model in a computer could become conscious because of that. Whereas a lot of people, and I feel like every time I talk to somebody, I ask them a question, do you need embodied AI to get the AGI? And I heard in some stats that 50% of scientists think yes, and 50% of scientists you think you don't need the embodied part. But more and more, I'm hearing that you do. And is that what you're saying too, that simulation can only get you so much about physics, but you need to physically touch something. You need to physically smell something and you know be there to actually get that extra bit of uh, you know, um, what is that word? You know, uh, where they're, where they're just, uh, emergent properties yeah. and reasoning. <laughs> I, um, it depends how you define AGI, right? Cause I, I think at least open AI's definition of AGI is artificial intelligence that can perform most economically viable tasks better than most humans. I, I think it's mm -hmm. like a very kind of, uh, ambiguous definition, but I feel like we're almost there. If you're if you're talking about singularity, where we actually have uh, AI that can think and understand, it's alive. Um, I think, <laughs> therefore, I am right. Yeah. Uh, I, I I don't know. I I think you probably do need something more than just language alone. Um, referencing Jan Jan LeCun again, uh, he put out a tweet a couple of weeks ago that I thought was really interesting. It's kind of a thought experiment that shows maybe language isn't enough. So it goes something like, um, imagine you're uh, on, on uh, you know, at the North Pole and you walk 200 meters in one direction, you turn left and you walk continuously forever. Will you ever cross your original location? Um, and the point of the thought experiment is when you think about it, you're, you're not using language to consider it. You're using spatial reasoning. You're, you're kind of picturing what's going on. Um, and so in that scenario, 
you you can't really use language as much to think through that problem. It's just more spatial reasoning. So I don't I don't know. I don't know if um, large language models will will get us there. I think likely we are going to need an embodiment for agents for AI uh, to to achieve actual singularity. Uh, Dr. Jim Fan at NVIDIA is doing some yeah. really interesting things on that topic, right? They're, um, they have like the Voyager project, which allows agents to explore Minecraft. Um, they, they have, um, I, I forget what the other projects are called, but essentially kind of simulation environments where you can run simulations of robotic parts, hands, full body motion, everything essentially uh, over and over again to kind of train embodied models. So um, yeah, there's a lot of work there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure to be honest. Um, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm excited to just see what what is uh, what's coming, and um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Well, I mean, so get, coming back to you know, you've you've kind of looked at all these different competitors, uh, companies. Okay, whether they are OpenAI or Google, Amazon, Meta, but then you also have all these humanoid bot companies and different bot companies that uh, figure. Sanctuary just announced a big partnership today with Magna to manufacture the bots. You've got uh, Aptronic, there's many of them. And then you got Tesla. Do you think, from what you understand, uh, for both of those you know, disciplines, right, AI and robotics, who is going to lead and what is Tesla's leadership in that space? Um, yeah, figure looks very impressive. Um, that's probably the one that I'm, I'm most familiar with outside of Optimus. I think there's also just as a side note something to be said about just the cool factor. Um, the uh, the the figure robot just looks really cool um, mm -hmm. as compared to a lot of others, and so does Optimus. Optimus looks mm -hmm. really cool. Again, like bringing it back to what we talked about at the beginning, I think Tesla's insane amount of real world data is going mm -hmm. to allow them to do things that other companies cannot. Um, figure doesn't have that. Figure mm -hmm. is. You know they're 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 probably they're, you know they have probably have to acquire their training data. Um, Tesla, man, I mean they just have so much real world training data to train their models. And and um, you know I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against Elon on anything. So I think I think like if if you were to say you can place a bet on one robotics company. <laughs> um, it, it's, it would be Tesla for me and I, I'm not like a huge Elon fanboy or anything. Uh, I just, I can see and, 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 you know, I, I can understand the amount of data that they have, the amount of GPUs that they have and how he's thinking about it. I, I would probably bet on Optimus being the, the most capable robot, the soonest. Yeah. Many are of the humanoid bot vendors and the CEOs I've interviewed. Uh, many of them will say that you do, uh, they do agree that the more bots you have out there, let's say you have a thousand bots, uh, that's what you need to learn lots of different tasks. And th they're also saying that they, you know, it's not like you just teach them one task at a time, that if you teach a bot many different tasks, then their emergent properties come and they actually <laughs> understand. Uh, you know, they call it, what did they call it? Zero shot, where they just showing some yeah. brand new environment and it knows what it's going to do there without it being trained before. That's where they're going to go. And so, you know, again, if you believe, and, I do, and I'm one, that volume matters, the more, and Tesla's going to create, the, they're, they're going to be the first, right? To 1,000 bots. They'll be the first to 10,000 bots. They'll be the first to 100,000 bots. Very, very likely that that's the case based on yeah, what and we know today. Yeah. I, 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 you're right. And, um, Tesla, I think maybe two years ago made the switch from kind of a hybrid approach for their autonomous vehicles between right. a, a neural net and more, um, yeah. neural hard coded yeah. Yeah. logic for their autonomous yeah. vehicles to full mm -hmm. end to end neural net. Yeah. Like the, no instructions for how to handle different situations is pure training on data. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, the results are, are obvious. Like they're, newer versions of their autonomous driving, their full self driving is really impressive as compared to previous generations. Um, that, you know, seems to be the right way to do it. That is how the human mind works. Um, we're, we're just, we're learning through our senses and we're storing that data and, and we're kind of our own model. Um, and uh, that, that is 
what Elon believes will work. And it seems like that is the way to do it. And that is your, the quality of that approach is 100% based on how much data and how high quality your data is. And again, Tesla is, is like, I don't, I don't know any other company that has even close to the amount of data that they do. Yeah. Let's come back to Tesla, but I do want to, because you have such a broad knowledge of what's happening out there. So let's start with the LLMs. Who is leading? Or just in general, AI. Who's leading in AI? Is it Meta because they bought the most? Is it OpenAI partnership with Microsoft because they're, you know, their ecosystem? Is it Google because they started first? Is there some new, like the rabbit? <laughs> Tell me what, what you're seeing out there. So if we're talking about pure large language model capabilities slash quality, for a long time, GPT-4 was the king. Um, they were only recently dethroned, but they were dethroned. And now the company Anthropic, which makes mm -hmm. the model called Claude, Claude 3 Opus in particular, dethroned them. And uh, Claude 3 Opus is incredible. It really is. I'd say the only thing that GPT-4 still wins on is speed, inference speed. And that that is very important, how fast mm -hmm. the model replies to you. Claude three opus is still like quite slow, but the responses are fantastic. Um, open AI is obviously well positioned. I, it, like it, now let me speak more broadly. I think Microsoft is just the genius in the room. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. They, they bought 49% of open AI. They're also <laughs> partnered with Facebook. They're also like, I, they just have their finger in, in everything. Um, so it, it, like if I were to bet on, yeah, a single AI company, I, I, you know, Microsoft's already the biggest company in the world, but like, dang, yeah. how do you, uh, like the, the Satya Nadella, geez, he's, he just, um, did, did not want another mobile, right? He, the, Microsoft missed the wave on mobile and he got right. way ahead of it this time. And, um, they just, uh, yeah, they're, they're killing it, uh, in, in every way. Um, I think on the flip side to that meta is, is doing really interesting stuff because a lot of what they're doing is open source and i i'm a big proponent of open source i i think um ai needs to be open source and so llama 3 is coming out i think pretty soon like in the next few weeks uh so they have a lot of really cool stuff that they're doing and um i i like meta meta is uh, not a company that i've loved over the years you know but now that they're just releasing everything with uh, in the open source world and and um just all the contributions they're making to the open source AI community. I'm, I'm very appreciative of them now. Um, so yeah, I think like it, it kind of, it's kind of a little bit disappointing that the biggest companies in the world are the ones most likely to win in the AI space. Oh, okay. um, but uh, you know, it, that that's how I'm seeing it right now. Okay. And how are these guys going to make money though? Right? So obviously what's happening now in terms of stock Nvidia, rightly so is just skyrocketing up and put, continue up. And you can talk about that too, but Nvidia is no longer going to be just a chip compute system. They're yeah. now getting into obviously supporting nine humanoid bot companies, quite a number of the, uh, autonomous driving companies are in biology. <laughs> They're going to get their hands in everything, maybe a little too many things. But so they're making money. They got real money. They got that's cash coming in the door. Now you've I've heard that uh, companies like Stability AI they said that they are losing a hundred million dollars a year. They only make two million bucks revenue. Do you think that these companies that are such a hype darlings right now, but they're not making money? So why is Tesla not seen as an AI company yet? You know, even though they're not making money quite yet. Yeah, um, so OpenAI is making a ton of revenue, but I think they're really the only one, right? And and again, that's why I point to Microsoft and how smart mm -hmm. they are. But uh, that aside, um, yeah, models are becoming commoditized. Uh, the the price for inference is going to drop and continue to drop. Um, but let, let's like let's talk about Meta for a second, right? Because mm -hmm. open source, they're giving giving it away. How do they actually make money? Um, there's a lot of examples throughout the history of technology of uh, open source platforms or kind of services being given away. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you build a lot of developer appreciation and developer love and developers start building on top of your architecture. 
And so when you as a company become the standard, Llama 3, whatever, whatever the architecture is, all of the development becomes built on top of you and then you become the platform and you have a ton of influence over the direction that the AI industry takes. So I think that's like how meta in particular will make money. Like they will just be the platform. And even though they're giving away the model for free, they're going to provide a ton of services that are required to scale up artificial intelligence to commercial use cases. And that's where they're going to make a lot of their money. Um, I, I don't know how model companies in the long run make money though, um, because they, they'll make money, but it's just a race to the bottom on pricing. And so if you look at the AI stack and the different places where value will be created, uh, you have the chips at the bottom and Nvidia is crushing it. Grok is doing great stuff. Um, but uh, above that, you have infrastructure, and I, I think there's a lot of money to be made there. So that's inference providers, that is like um, like uh, agent frameworks, um, LLM evaluation tools, like everything you need as a builder of a product or service to to um, to to put out the best product. Uh, above that is like the models themselves, and as I mentioned, they're becoming commoditized. I really don't know how you make money in the long term as a model builder provider um, and then you have the app layer at the very top and those are applications either that are like ai native applications or uh existing applications that are integrating with artificial intelligence in some way are powering themselves in some way um, i think probably the infrastructure layer and the app layer are the two layers that i'm particularly interested in and that will likely have a lot of value created over the next few years um, back to Tesla, I, I, um, they, they are going to use AI to build incredible products. So full self-driving, I think, um, RoboTaxi is coming right August 8th. Mm -hmm. I think he announced, uh, mm -hmm. he being Elon. Um, so like they're, they're building AI into their products and so they can sell those things. Um, but uh, I, I don't think um, Tesla is going to be a model provider anytime soon. And I think Grok is maybe just doing it. I, I made a video. It's like he's almost doing it out of spite uh, <laughs> towards open AI, right? He's like putting out the model weights. He's making he it open give source. it away for free though, right? right? He's, 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 he's going to be the new because... open AI. He should change right. X to be open X or something. <laughs> right, exactly. So I, I think like his motives are are maybe a little different and meme-ish, but um. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, uh, I'm excited uh, in particular about the, um, uh, the the app layer and the uh, kind of the uh, the architecture layer. So uh, let's talk about the future a little bit of what could happen, right? So you did a great video on Rabbit. Rabbit is this device oh, yeah. that you can communicate with. Uh, curious what you think because I mean we all have iPhones and cell phones on the phone and you can talk to it and AI is going to be available there. I, to Apple will come up with something very powerful eventually where you can make AI do things for you. These guys, in the absence of Apple doing that, they said, I'm going to create a device. Then you've got the pin that you pin, like almost like the Star Trek thing, you pin it and then you can always talk to AI and it can do things for you. Now that, you know, AI is actually connected to the world, it can actually, you know, book me tickets and it can do that, right? And then you've got Tesla where they've, you, you, you know, I think the obvious things it's going to be in the car and it's going to be the bot. Do you think Tesla might come up with something like this? Uh, although, you know, we've heard Elon say it's going to be the fastest input output. It's going to be through the brain connection directly instead of thumbs, the slow thumbs, but voice, could he do that so that you have access to the ecosystem anywhere you are? But anyways, let's start with Rabbit and that pin. What's your thoughts on those? Um, I bought the Rabbit day one. I'm very excited <laughs> yeah. about it. Um, yeah. For I mean, first of all, Teenage Engineering designed it. It's gorgeous. <laughs> uh, it's very bright, kind of very bold color, but I love it. I love it. And it's a new toy, new form factor. I, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm all about kind of whatever the new cool gadget is. So like mm -hmm. it fit with my personality really well. So I bought one plus $200. I mean, that, that's yeah. like, that's hard to beat. Um, yeah. So, I mean, so there's, a, there's a lot of, sorry, does it, does it, is it useful? 
Yeah. So um, we'll see. Um, I, I should be getting mine in like the next couple of weeks, and I'm definitely okay. going to make a lot of reviews about it. Um, okay. It looks like it'll be useful. I think the form factor of the the screen kind of falling away over time makes sense to me. Voice as the main interaction method with large language models makes a lot of sense to me as well. I've made predictions that in mm -hmm. 10 years, mm -hmm. kind of programmers, most programmers will not be needed anymore. And I'll, I'll tell you why this is relevant to what we're talking about. When you're using natural language to speak to artificial intelligence and the AI, the large language model, is executing your command right then and there or creating your content right then and there, there's no app layer anymore, right? It's essentially just large language models and APIs. So I'm, I'm very bullish on that in the long run and Rabbit, their, kind of their, their take on it is very aligned with that vision. So they have a screen, but it's a very minimalist screen. And the main interaction method is your voice. There's no keyboard, nothing like that. So I'm very excited to get that. And I do believe that that is likely going to be the um, form factor of the future. Yes, Apple, uh, Google with Android, they will come with AI in their phones. Um, but it's very hard for a large company to make revolutionary changes. Like this is the innovator's dilemma. True. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's just it's very hard. So if it takes Rabbit producing something like this to push these other companies, the bigger companies, to see things differently, great. I hope Rabbit succeeds. But it's very clear to me that that Rabbit form factor is going to be the future of how humans interact with computers. That's very clear. Okay. So now the AI pin. Um, the price put me off immediately. It's seven hundred, eight hundred dollars plus a yearly fee. Um, that's a lot. Uh, plus, I don't want to wear something. I just mm -hmm. don't. Um, I also don't want it recording. Uh, you know, having a camera pointed out all the time. I, I'm sure they have a lot of security features. Um, I'm not trying to, you know, poop on what they've done. Um, I'm uh, any any time a company get started anytime somebody tries something new like I, you have all of my appreciation yeah. but this that form factor is not for me so that's why i chose to go with rabbit i probably will end up buying a pin just to review it um but i'm i'm particularly excited about the rabbit device and then what do you see tesla do you think that they'll just you know what what new things might they release because you know I've, one of the <clears throat> common mistakes people have is they always think oh this is what tesla's doing this one and this one and that's it no right. two years later three years later four years later there's new things they're going to release and so you know where, where do you where do you see this going um so we, we talked about agents in the car i you know tesla has devices in the field the cars right they, they already have this so um it it is a form factor that humans will be using for a very long time. So I think it integrates kind of the voice, the natural language as the primary interface. It makes a lot of sense just integrating it directly into the car. I, I don't, you know, like you said, it's very hard to predict if they're going to come out with a separate product um, that yeah. is some kind of new computing device. I, I don't know. Um, I definitely wouldn't put it beyond them, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen anytime soon. It seems like the much more obvious path would be to build more and more functionality into the computer on wheels. That is, you know, the Tesla vehicles. You know, it's several times, uh, many of the Tesla engineers, a couple of times anyways, I've seen, they refer to not only the humanoid form factor, but different bot animals. So, I think that they're going to be producing not only the Optimus, you know, one time he joked about an Optimus, <laughs> but uh, there's going to be different form factors. Um, and then what's your thoughts on like Apple talking about now getting to home robotics? Um, so, you know what I mean? Like there's going to be, one of the things about Tesla, just getting back to that, <clears throat> that it, tell me if I'm wrong, because the idea was what Tesla has is the ability to use cameras in the case, in this case, cars to be able to understand the world. He called it baby AGI because these cameras need to, using the you know anti-neural network, knows what a tree is, knows what a fire hydrant is, 
knows the curb height and knows the context, that that's fog, I can drive through it. But you can take that and, uh, and apply it to anything with a camera. Anything with a camera can become intelligent. And so at that point, you can make anything that Tesla could decide to make a camera looking at the swimming pool, or it could do anything. What? Yeah. Is that true or, or different? Wrong? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, and I think you kind of nailed it uh, earlier. Uh, it, it's really all about embodiment. I hadn't heard that they're thinking about animal form factors. That's cool. Um, Boston Dynamics, right? They have like the robot dog. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it makes sense. And it, it depends on the use case in the real world. But I, I think like all of that data, as long as we're talking about putting it into some kind of embodied uh, AI, I think it can be applied because it is general real world environment data. It isn't necessarily specific to a car, specific to a humanoid robot. Uh, so I, I think that it can apply as long as you're trying to have some kind of AI in the real world. And it doesn't even need to necessarily have an a, 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 you know, embodiment, um, as long as it needs to operate within the bounds of the real world, I think that data will still be very valuable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you looking forward to the AI future? <laughs> what is it? What can you describe to me what you're envisioning? Where are we going to be five years from now? And what's that looking like? <laughs> um, I, I am very excited. I tend to be an optimist. I 100% understand the potential risks, um, the potential misuses, but personally, I'm I'm very excited. Um, I I want an AI assistant that knows mm -hmm. me, knows what I need. Not only can I ask it and direct it to do things for me, but it is mm -hmm. uh, predicting what I need. Kind of the promise of Siri. Uh, that didn't work out. Um, yeah. That that is what I want: a true AI assistant agent that does what I needed to do, gets ahead of where I need to go. Um, that that is that is something I'm I'm really excited about. I, home home robots is something I'm yeah. also very excited about. Although yep. I think we're pretty far off from that now. Um, still, what do you say that? What do you say that? Um. I, uh, again, like look at full self driving. Um, it's extremely impressive, but that last ten percent is really important, and that last ten percent is very difficult. Uh, you know, it's like the the eighty twenty problem or the the eighty twenty concept. Mm -hmm. Eighty percent of the work is that last twenty percent. Um, so I think I think achieving that last ten percent, getting it perfect. Uh, you know, I actually just drove uh, full self driving like a couple weeks ago, and yeah. uh, you know it. It, it's fantastic, but then it'll not see a stop sign. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, it w when you have lives on the line, like it's incredibly important to get it right. And and robots at home can go wrong, right? These are very powerful machines um, that can move quickly, and they have a lot of strength. And it needs to be able to behave within the home safely especially when you're factoring in if you have kids, if you have pets yeah. who don't understand this thing is a robot and it can move and it has a mind of its own. Um, so that's why I, I don't necessarily think we're really close to that. I think we're probably yeah. pretty darn close to having robots in factories. And and yeah. um, I, know, I know there's a lot of Chinese companies or a few Chinese companies that are already deploying massive amounts of robots inside of factories. I know that's what the Optimus robot is going to be, at least the mm -hmm. first iteration. Yeah. Um, but like the home robot, I think I think we're pretty we're pretty far away from that. Maybe yeah, ten fifteen years. So I I agreed with you before. I just interviewed Bre uh, Bernd Bornick, who's the CEO of One X Robotics, another awesome robotics company. Yeah. So what he told me just just literally a few days ago, I interviewed him. I'll drop that video. By the time this video launches, I think I would have published the one with uh, One X. Uh, he blew my mind because he's totally taken a different approach than everybody else. So you and I think that they're going to start with factories, right? He designed his bot to be. It actually looks it looks childish. It looks like a a, a teddy bear. Yeah. Because it actually doesn't have actuators. It has tendons. And it's, it's so that if you hit it and it's, it's actually like 60, 60 plus pounds. 
I'm not kidding. It's not a hundred wow, plus that's, pounds. That's super interesting. Like, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. He said the weight matters because of what you said. It's too dangerous. Right. If it's a hundred pounds, I could fall on somebody, but 60 pounds, not going to hurt anybody. Um, so they designed it to be very, very safe. Now, the thing that blew my mind is he said, we are going to go consumer first. We're going to go home first. And what? The reason he's doing that, he said, is that in any kind of technology that's ever become like hugely revolutionary, it always started with consumer and then it trickles down to the enterprise. It never goes like, oh, I created this thing for the factory. Now I'm going to make it like something that consumers will buy in mass. And he's going to do it in numbers. So by having a, you know, lots of, you know, cheap, right? Like very cost effective, very small, uh, you know, bots. And then you have numbers, consumer buys them just like the rabbits, you know, the more out there, the more it learns and understands, and then it can become useful. So what do you think about that? This idea that go consumer first? Yeah. I mean, um, I, I think it makes sense because there's, definitely a bigger market for consumers. There's more opportunity to place more robots, which means more data, which means, you know, yeah. more training. Uh, it, it is interesting what you said about how they're thinking about safety. I always thought the, so, so the one X robot looks like it's wrapped in fabric, right? right? It kind of, it kind of, it kind of looks corny. Yeah. Um, compared to, um, Right. Uh, you said figure, right? So a figure steel. robot. Like right. So cool. And it, yeah. And it looks cool. But now I'm like, oh, okay. That actually makes more sense why you would yeah. want it really lightweight and not actually have actuators on it. Um, yeah. So, so that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, if you're going for the consumer play first, that's certainly a higher hurdle in terms of safety. Um, but it, it's, de it's interesting. And actually I, you had asked about Apple, mm -hmm. uh, doing home robotics and I didn't, yeah, I didn't yeah. mention that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that's really cool. I know that they just shut down Project Titan, which is their car project. Um, and as we've talked about, large companies making revolutionary products is very, very difficult. Um, so I'd, I'd probably think, like, hey, I'm, look, I'm all for it. That's awesome. Um, but uh, Apple takes a long time to deliver products. Yeah. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of startups right? who probably beat them to the market, including One yeah. X. Yeah, yeah. I wish that they got into the home robotics game first because obviously it makes most sense, right? I make a tiny little phone. I'm going to make a little Roomba. I'm going to make a kind of, you know, a dog-like thing that's, you know, for the home and then I'll make a humanoid. But they didn't go that route. I'm going to make a car. <laughs> it's yeah. like, What? You know, it's like, yeah, you already know that it was never going to happen. But I mean, they, they were thinking, right, that they want access that humans live in cars, um, you know, entertainment, travel, and you need to be entertained there. You need to carry your experience on your phone. I mean, anyways, you know, I mean, they just think that it's a tremendous opportunity there for entertainment. Well, I mean, um, I, look, I hope I hope they do deliver a really cool home rob a robot product. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, we've been talking about humanoid robots and I was just listening to the All In podcast and they were talking yeah. about this robotics company that is making kind of vertical uh, AI robots. So form factors that are more niche, um, specific use cases. And that's, I believe, the easier path, the more commercialized uh, path. Um, yeah. The human humanoid robot form factor is is difficult uh because yeah. you're it's like a generalized robot that needs to be able to do everything versus having more vertical robots that are only applicable to a, a limited set of use cases um so it'll be interesting i if i had to guess i'd think apple would go after the humanoid um form factor yeah. just because that's well, uh, they don't you know mm -hmm. the very i don't know there's they're in their dna maybe um but um yeah i um I am excited about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I am talking to uh, a CEO of a lawnmower AI company, and they've reinvented the lawnmower. So they're going to control the kind of the, you know, the the car, the vehicles. Uh, Tesla has that. Then you got the home robots. Tesla has that and others. Then he, they want to own anything that happens, uh, you know, in your lawn and your garden and your trees and all that. So yeah. being very, very specific on a use case is just smart, obviously. Um, do you think that Tesla would need to get into the, um, uh, like the AR glasses and 
the only reason they might is that you know when you have the cars they all have eight cameras and so it's capturing data and that feeds a neural net and that's what teaches it how does the home robot or how's the the robot in the factory how do they do this until they can make millions of them they don't have access to that video of understanding and you know the, the environment and teaching at the the area so i always thought that i always thought this years ago that they would get into air glasses get consumers to buy it and now you got the picture of my fridge i opened the fridge i got that that's a beer i grabbed that beer now it knows all that and then the humanoid bot can now learn that too um do you think that's still necessary or maybe that's not necessary anymore you know i hadn't thought of that um I, I don't know. I don't I don't necessarily think it's required. I think all of their driving data is probably enough to get the robots to be really proficient at a lot of things. And then you get more robots into the field and you get all that data. Um I don't know. Do they need another like product right I now? I, I just no. I yeah. I, I'm I a big so. proponent of focus. Yeah. Um but at the I'm like conflicted because Tesla has multiple products that have potentially trillion dollar markets. So like I'm I'm very excited about all the different things they're doing, but I also want them to like okay, let's let's now focus and get a, one of these things to work really well. Um, so I I don't know. I I probably like my gut tells me I would prefer they didn't yeah, uh, get into yeah. a, like a completely new product line, yeah. and it's also unproven. Even though Apple just stepped in the space. Um, you know, I have an Apple Vision Pro. Yeah, I you didn't return it. it. <laughs> I haven't used it in a month. It's it's like a very expensive. You should have returned right it. Now. Should have returned um, it. Like everyone yeah, else. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I think they can. I think Tesla can get plenty far with just the data that they're collecting from their vehicles, and then inevitably their robots. Okay. Let me ask you about Dojo. Um, where do you think Dojo sitting? How likely? The, obviously, the most recent. Uh, earnings call, people thought, oh, I think I heard them. The way he, they're talking about it, Dojo's dead. It's nowhere to be found. And then they announced that they are no longer compute constrained. So could that just because they bought so much NVIDIA and AMD and others? Or did they actually get Dojo working? And then what do you think about the idea of Dojo as a service? Um, the last I remember about Dojo is actually a few years ago at, a, I think it was AI Day, um, and they, they mentioned it's like a, a new architecture with their own silicon. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that, am I remembering correctly? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah, so, yeah um, following it closely. It, it's kind of yeah. conflicting to hear that they're buying so many NVIDIA GPUs, but then they also have Dojo. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably, they've realized it's going to take them longer to roll out a completely end-to-end mm -hmm. -end custom chip. Yep. Apple did mm -hmm. it and it took years and years and years to do. Um, I don't, I mean, yeah, I think, I think um, compute as a service is, is going to be a thing for a very long time. In fact, um, there's been a few people, a few leaders, I believe Sam Altman, one of them saying, mm -hmm. and actually I just interviewed the Grok G R O Q C E O. G R O Q. Yeah. G R O Q. Right. By the and, way. And yeah, just uh, they, they all seem to. Yeah. They they all seem to be in consensus that compute is going to be the mm -hmm. currency of the future. Yeah. Um, so all of this investment from different companies, whether we're talking about Meta, uh, OpenAI, kind of, you know, looking to raise a ton of money and building their own supercomputer data centers. I think it makes a lot of sense in the long run because if compute is the currency of the future, all of these investments today are going to be very valuable in the future. Um cool. And that that makes sense, right? If every if AI is kind of layered onto every aspect of humanity, <laughs> and we need compute to run AI, uh, compute will be the currency, right? Dollars will just pay for compute, and the compute will give us the value. What do you think about the uh, the seven trillion dollar thing that Sam Altman said that he needs to raise? <laughs> that crazy numbers, or is that what it is? What it takes? No, I think he just realized compute compute is the currency of the future. I think he also realized that models are becoming commoditized very, very quickly. Um, he also realized they have an insane platform risk building on top of other people's compute uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think all of those things, I, I don't know, 7 trillion is like an insane amount of money. But then, you know, 
OpenAI and Microsoft just announced a partnership to build a new supercomputer, uh, supercomputer kind of server uh, data center. So again, it's like conflicting. He's raising a bunch of money um, to build their own chips, but then at the same time, they've partnered with Microsoft to roll out a new data center. So I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I think. I think uh, compute is going to be the currency of the future, and and whoever is investing in it now is going to be very happy in the long run. Any thoughts then on the uh, if compute is the future, data centers are the future. Compute it takes a lot of electricity, lots of power, mm. and so now you've heard Amazon bought a data warehouse that's right on a nuclear power plant, <laughs> like they yeah. bought it from a very side of nuclear power plant. Of course, Tesla is well positioned because of their energy, you know. They're, they're just lead in energy. No one can touch them there. So uh, Elon's been saying that this year it's chips is the, is the you know, the rate limiting step is whoever gets the most chips. A couple of years from now, it's going to be transformers. And then a year later after that, it's going to be energy. Who has the most energy to power these? Uh, yeah. And, and when you say transformers, you mean the hardware transformers, not the yes, software. Right. Yeah, hardware yeah, that but, converts completely. the electricity to be useful. To be usable, hundred percent, hundred percent. It's going to be super interesting to see, and I think you're right. Uh, and we didn't even talk about this until just now. Tesla is very well positioned with energy because electricity is the thing that powers the compute, and it's not enough to just have the compute. You also need the energy, and um, the the U.S. in general um, doesn't have the best electric grid. Um, yeah, there was this thing, I can't remember who it is, and I can't remember the actual number, but this is real. An expert said this. Like somebody said to them, why can't you just build one data center in that same city, that same location? And he said something like, I don't know, can't number, again, can't remember the numbers. Once you get past a thousand, whatever these data center things, it it it, it turn, <laughs> cuts off the grid. Yeah, and so they need for to the create state. In the state. That's what they're finding now, that it's already gotten so big, so energy consumption that they can't just create one big data center in one place they need to now you know go elsewhere yeah so I, I i read that too that's so fascinating and then i i forget who it was but they basically said when they were training their models they couldn't do it in a single data center they actually had to link multiple data centers together and that's part of the their tech that they're building um and i, I think the future is going to be very modular data centers with nuclear power plants attached to them essentially yep. like fun of mini nuclear power plants powering data centers and you know if you think about that having that all over the US um yeah. very modular it's actually pretty secure like if you know yeah. one goes it's down you still got yeah, it's very yeah. distributed in that sense and i i don't know uh, i'm far from an expert on this but it sounds right yeah. to me i have a theory <laughs> it was just formed just 2 days ago and it was just a weird thing, but um, you know Tesla superchargers, yeah, yeah. And um, Drew Baglino was saying that these superchargers, they've completely been focusing on how quickly they can create them, right? And not only the supercharger, but the mega pack, yeah. the canopy, and the solar, the solar. And then they're making it so fast. Now, the, then somebody said, yeah, but that doesn't matter, right? Because what really slows everything down is the uh, the, the regulations and then, you know, the installing installing it. Yeah. But they, they make it and then they deliver it and then it's, they, you know, they do everything so that when they actually need to install it, it's just plug and play and stick it down. They don't do any more work as much as they used to on the site. Yeah, yeah. So you carry that forward and you go, hmm, what if you take a little mini where, you know, like a shed size computer system, right? A data center, data center, canopy, solar panel, and then just distribute it all over the country. And then it's all like connected through Starlink. And if it's connected to Starlink, you don't even need to be <laughs> anywhere in the grid. Yeah. You create your own grid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is exactly what we're talking about. That's why Tesla has so many moonshot opportunities that it's working on in parallel. Let me, let me ask you something, Herbert. Um, so I have a Tesla, but I also have a non-Tesla electric vehicle. I was on a road trip taking the non-Tesla electric vehicle, um, and I stopped at an Electrify America station. <laughs> yeah. And for, first of all, they're horrible. But that yes. aside, um, yep. it really made me appreciate the Tesla um, infrastructure. But okay, that aside, I looked behind the Electrify America stations. It was covered with you know a wall, but I, lo I looked over it, and there there was 
Tesla packs back there. I, I don't know yeah. what they were. Yeah. Packs? Yeah. But, yeah. but like, is that is that all it is? It's like Electrify America is just the brand on top of a Tesla hardware? Is, is I that what no I idea. saw? I did, I did not know that. But we do know that uh, Tesla superchargers, they have mega pack. Uh, you know, send areas there so that they uh, any extra, and then they're now converting as many of them to be solar, self sufficient solar. So it's actually free energy now. Tesla's going to make yeah. a lot of margin. Yeah, uh, and and like if they're selling their hardware to other electric, yeah. um, yeah, providers, yeah, they own it. They own it. I yeah. mean, that, like, yeah, I, I just, I, it was so surprising. I kept looking. I was like, why is there Tesla branded hardware behind the Electrify America <laughs> station? Because they need it, and there's no other options. Yeah. Right. I didn't know that. That's hard. It's hard to do. Yeah. And it's just unbelievable. So energy is going to be the, you know, the currency of the future in order to power the compute. Yeah, absolutely. The, which then does intelligence. Um, yeah. So final thoughts on the, on the, the uh, robots and just coming back to that again, like, you know, so you got this AI, you got the X AI. <clears throat> Is there enough today, like from your understanding of AI today, it seems like, I guess when everybody started AI or robots, they all thought, oh, hardware is going to be the easy part. And once I solve hardware, it's going to be the AI that's going to take a long time before this thing does useful work. And now uh, the comment by the CEO figure, Brett Adcock said, he's shocked that it's actually the other way around, that the AI is already there, easier to train. Do you think that uh, we're already there to be able to, you know, train these bots to do useful work, uh, whether it's through teleoperation, whether it's through simulation, whether it's through just, uh, you know, the bot watching a video of a human doing it and then be able to replicate it? Are we there? Yeah, I, I think chat GPT, large language models, the transformers architecture, I, I think that they really opened up uh, a lot of possibilities. I think um, a lot of people saw what is possible now and with enough scale large language models can achieve a lot uh, as as we've spoken about um we probably are almost there we probably are almost there on the on the ai side um but again like the the whole like 80 20 thing yeah um, you don't know that bit mm -hmm. like how, i i don't see the current architectures being able to achieve a hundred percent, whatever you want to call it, accuracy, quality. Uh, there needs to be something else, either a complete architecture change or some kind of uh, additional piece of the architecture that hasn't been realized yet. Um, but just being able to use tools like what NVIDIA's team is doing, um, what uh, you know now that uh, Figure is partnered with. Uh, uh, chat GPT open AI I think the like a lot can be accomplished right now I, I don't think we're quite at like the, this is a commercial product yet but we're it feels like we're pretty close um humanoid robot at home that I still think we're pretty far off on but like uh, demo wise being able to accomplish some pretty amazing things as we've seen with Optimus as we've seen with figure yeah. um it like we're it, they're they're doing it so um it's it's impressive. We're here. Okay. And then back to LLM. So the progress there has been so fast. You you can now talk to it and it gives you pretty good darn answers. Then all of a sudden they drop Sora. It's another example where you can just use, you know, just statements and I'll create a video. Initially it was like a few seconds. Now it's like even longer. And eventually you can create a whole movie out of just right. They'll just generate a world for you the way you like it. What's next? What comes after that? What are you looking forward to? Um, so Sora is incredible. I want to use it. I think it's still like, like why? I, yeah, I think that's probably what I'm most excited about. Um, I, I'm I love video games, so the idea that I can describe a video game, yeah. and it be created in real time for me, and not only the game be created statically, but actually dynamically as I'm playing it. That that's very exciting to me. That's one thing that I'm I'm really really looking forward to. Uh, I think that there in in the fairly near future is going to be content delivered to an audience of one, and that whole concept I'm I'm very excited about. Whether you're talking about TV, yeah. movies, video games, wow. 
uh, podcasts. Uh, it's just generated dynamically in the moment for an audience of one. So I can describe the TV show that I want to see. I want to see another season of The Wire. Um, that that's just it's so cool. Yeah, it's it's, it's so cool to think about. And um, yeah, yeah. Just a, I think that's maybe one of the things I'm most excited about. Um, that is interesting. Yeah. If I love the Jetsons, I'll say, you know, they don't make it anymore, of course, or the Flintstones. Create me an episode about the Flintstones, but yeah. make it about, you know, today's world or something like that. Yet the Flintstones, but about the current society, or something like that. And they'll do it, right? Because yeah. they'll know the style. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we're not far off from that, Herbert. Um, wow. There was a project called The Simulation, which basically had a model trained on South Park. Right. And you could, I made a video about it. You can describe an episode of South Park and it will create it end to end. The, the, the dialogue, yeah. the actual voice acting, the, um, the animations, the yeah. script, the, the style of jokes that they make. Yeah. It'll just yeah. in the style and, and that they look, do. Like, yeah. uh, AI getting comedy right is, is like, I, I haven't seen it, but this was impressive nonetheless. So I think we're not far from, yeah content for an audience of one that is brilliant okay i didn't think of that and back to you know when i said that in robotics the hard part turned out to be the opposite of what you thought right the ai everybody thought it was going to be same comment right was made about ai where it was in a sam altman who said that you thought that creativity would be the last thing yeah. that AI would be able to do but in fact what we saw was creativity was first. You know, hey, ChatGPT, create, create me a poem, create me a song, draw me a painting. That was solved before, you know, the other things, uh, intelligence and others. So that's like, you know, shocking how what we thought was going to happen is complete the opposite. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. Um, for years, people thought automation and AI was... Yeah obviously going to take over blue collar jobs first easy right, right? yes yeah. then it was almost overnight where that whole notion was flipped on its head <laughs> right and yep. and it turns out like programmers was like programmers lawyers doctors the <laughs> lawyers, the, yeah, jobs, you lawyer. no, the thought the thought like white collar right uh you know thought right jobs um yeah. the, those those were the first to to be <laughs> automated um sorry let me just yeah, I just want to do that. Yeah, those so, were those were the first to be automated, which was extremely surprising. Um, but now now we're in this environment where it turns out being able to work with your hands is actually incredibly valuable and probably has um, a lot of longevity to it. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I I come from like I'm you know an engineer. Uh, I I create content now online, and yeah, my job. First of all, engineer, I already predict that within 10 years, probably the programming yeah. industry won't look anything like it will today. Um, but also just content creation. I'll I make YouTube gone. videos. I don't, I don't like probably yeah. within the next 10 years, my job is going to look vastly different if at well, it's, it's didn't you already do a video where you had, uh, you had an AI do your talking for you and nobody noticed? <laughs> yeah. A few weeks ago, I was sick. I lost my voice and I wanted to put out a video. So I used 11 Labs. I uploaded yep. 30 seconds of one of my videos, cloned I heard my it. voice and put it out. I, I, I did it's pretty good. explicitly say at the beginning of the video that like, hey, this is AI. I didn't, no I didn't believe cared. you. I no didn't one believe cared. You. No, yeah. I didn't believe you. When you so, said that, um, it's like, I thought you were joking because they thought it's so good. It had your, <laughs> so yeah. we'll be gone. This will be and bad. I, I want to, I want to put together this pipeline of automation where I can maybe have a second channel and just, um, things yeah. that don't warrant an entire video on my main channel. Maybe I'll just type in a prompt like here, or here's an article I want to make yeah. a video about and it'll generate yeah. the script and generate my voice and generate the B roll for it. And yeah. I think, I think that's really cool. It's a little scary because, like, you know, I'm investing a lot of time in building up a YouTube channel now, and um, there, there's a strong chance that that's gonna ma be made irrelevant pretty soon as well. I'll meet you at the beach when we have nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, deal. Yeah, deal. All right. All right, man. Thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, follow him on. I mean, obviously, you got to go check out his YouTube channel. That's why I found you. That's why I asked to meet you because your channel is brilliant. I absolutely love it. I'm learning so much. Um, you, you know, you really have uh, collected your your knowledge and explained it to people well. His ex handle is Matthew Berman, and of course, his YouTube channel. Thank you very much, Matthew.
Thank you, Herbert. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.